Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for this webinar on integrating AT for adapted physical education with Scott McNamara. Um, just briefly before we get started, we're going to give a short introduction of Scott just before he starts. Um, so, Scott is a newly minted PhD in adapted physical education from the Texas Women's University and is currently an assistant professor specializing in APE at the University of Northern Iowa. He also hosts a What's New in APE podcast, providing insight to the world of APE with leading experts in the field. Some of his past work includes the development of Camp Abilities Michigan for individuals with visual impairments, and he has written numerous articles and presented on this topic throughout the nation. So thank you all for being here, and thank you, Scott, for being with us today. Uh, with that, please feel free to start with your presentation. Um, all right, so my name is Scott McNamara. Uh, I'm a recent, recent, recent uh, PhD graduate. I just finished, actually, um, about a month ago, my PhD at Texas Women's University. And literally, uh, yesterday, I moved to the University of Northern Iowa, or Cedar Falls, and uh, I'm in my brand new office today. So, uh, and my area of specialty is adapted physical education. I've been teaching and doing research in the area for about six or seven years now. And something unique about uh, one of the things I've done is I developed a podcast, which I'll mention a little bit later, called What's New in Adapted Physical Education, where I interview researchers and teachers and sometimes related personnel with APE. And it's given me a really nice um, experience. I've done that for three years now of being able to really understand um, all these different perspectives that are in this field of adaptive physical education. Um, so in this presentation, we're going to learn about what is adaptive physical education and why it's important with students with disabilities. We're going to review some of the major federal laws that define a mandate APE and how to act actively advocate for APE. And then also, of course, we're going to talk about uh, incorporating assistive technology into adaptive physical education as well. Um, so, that kind of brings us to these uh, objectives that I want us to go over. It's always important to go over some objectives before going over a presentation to know what we want to achieve. So like I said, we want to understand specific benefits and how to advocate for AP because as we'll talk in a moment, um, you will see that AP is often an overlooked component within special education. We'll also talk about the federal laws that mandate APE because if you want to advocate for APE, they're very strong language in the law that can help you advocate for APE. And then lastly, and probably most importantly for this presentation, is we're going to identify uh, different levels of uh, assistive technology and understand how they can be utilized in an APE setting. However, let me just say, as far as the assistive technology goes, where there is a ton of different assistive technology that can be used within the field of APE. Um, so we're only going to be, uh, you know, hitting the, the, the top of the iceberg with this one. Um, but hopefully you can have some questions about assistive technology or any other things about APE that I can assist you with at the end. All right, so what we're going to do now is we are going to conduct a poll. Uh, I believe we have three polls where we're going to find out some of your uh, occupations and motivations as to why uh, you came to this presentation. Uh, I want to know this just so I can better understand who I'm talking to and you know, make sure that I'm pulling out some examples that are um, you know, relatable to you and useful for you. So I believe Todd is going to get those out for you. come out real quick to look at that. So hopefully you're filling out some of those polls right now. 
John, what are you? If you want to uh, tell me a little bit about yourself, if you're an other. Great. Wonderful. Great. Saw that, Nancy. Wonderful. We've got people from all over. Great. So AT specialist, parent advocates, APE teachers. Wonderful. We've got a nice mix within there. Exercise physiologist. Cool. Oh, cool. We got a public health researcher. That's interesting. Wow, we got a really nice mix in here. I like that. We have a few parent advocates and parent training information center people too. That's awesome because um, that's an, a, a group that we really want to be able to talk to about the importance of APE because they're really important as well. That's a group that we often um, are often asking us questions about how to advocate for it. So it's great to see you all here. Got an administrator. Wonderful. My dissertation was on that on uh, was on looking at um, the knowledge of administrators on APE. Great. Okay, great. I'll give us another minute or so and then I'm gonna uh, start going on this. I'm seeing all of your responses, which is really cool. And if at the end, do not feel like I love specific questions. So if you have specific questions at the end, and I really think that a lot of times those can be really helpful for everyone. Um, so we can try to problem solve anything that you're here for. All right. Cool. All right, well, it looks like we have a really nice mix of people um, that have come to the presentation, which is, that is really exciting. It looks like we have a pretty good turnout, too. So we're going to start talking about um, what is adaptive physical education now. And if you still want to answer some of those, I will see them as they pop up. So please continue. So we're going to start out with like kind of like what is adaptive physical education because uh, in my experience a lot of people have different concepts of what is adaptive physical education um, and as I said before it's an often overlooked thing uh, so I want to kind of just go over what it is what we do uh, and then how to advocate for us before we start talking about the AT in particular. So adaptive physical education is the art of developing, implementing, and monitoring uh, specially designed physical education for students with, with disabilities. And so it's important to recognize that uh, APE, which is, is the common referred name, is a lot of times it's called specially designed physical education in the law. And adaptive physical education can occur across the least restrictive environment. So um, adaptive physical education can occur in a general physical education setting, but maybe students have modifications or assistive technologies that they're using to access the curriculum. That can still be adaptive physical education. Uh, adaptive physical education teachers are often unique compared to general PE teachers uh, because they need to know, understand uh, both the PE curriculum and teaching styles and understand different um, assessment processes associated with the physical education, but they also need to understand some of those, uh, the realm of special education sometimes, such as the assessment and eligibility processes, the IEP processes, and then obviously the unique attributes associated with working with students with disabilities. And a lot of times uh, adaptive physical educators are unique in that they need to understand obviously the curriculum and how it deals with students with disabilities like sport and, and fitness, but they also need to understand some of those um, health concerns or physical concerns 
that students with disabilities may have when they, they come to a physical education program. Um, so physical education is a uh, curriculum that has both state and national standards. And so just like all other special education uh, areas that have a you know, state mandated curriculum, uh, it is important for us to conduct assessments on students with special needs and um, try our best to uh, help students attain uh, their grade level standards uh, to the best of their ability. So, and then adapted physical education provides the knowledge and skills to be successful with fitness, motor skills, and health skills, and sports, recreation, and leisure. And some of those terms right there are actually from the law, which I'll talk about a little bit more. Okay, now to talk a little bit more about what is adaptive physical education teach, there's three learning domains of adaptive physical education or physical education really, um, which make it unique compared to other curriculums. So the one that is most usually thought about is the physiological domain where we're teaching motor skills, sports skills, fitness skills, how to have a healthy lifestyle. But the other two I think are frequently um, not commonly thought about uh, when we talk about physical education, but I think they're very crucial to students with disabilities. So we have the affective domain, which is basically uh, socializing and communicating with one another and relationship building. And physical education is a huge place where this can occur. And uh, adaptive, if your student um, is in an adaptive physical education setting, uh, you may want them to uh, this is something that you could really try to hone in on and even have goals and objectives related to this for adaptive physical education. And one of the big things, which we'll, I have a quick lesson I'm going to show you, is uh, cooperative games, which are where we try to teach leadership skills, there's open-ended problems, and the students try to you know, work together to try to achieve that. So as well as then working in you know, team building and team sports, there's so much socializing that can occur through that and hopefully an adaptive physical education uh, teacher or specialist is trying to um, give the tools so that they can be successful in the, that relationship building and communication. And then there's a the cognitive domain, which is learning, um, you know, learning how to have a, a healthy and active lifestyle to be physically literate, but also, um, you know, so that's also could be then learning how to break down skills off with a task analysis on how to uh, do a proper push-up or throw a ball properly. Um, so this is that cognitive skill because there's a lot of cognitive skills that, that are related to both the affective and uh, uh, physiological domains. All right, so here are some uh, benefits, some other benefits, a little bit more about that just so you can advocate for APE. And so I didn't address in here the physiological benefits because I think they're somewhat obvious. Uh, but you know we know that there should be a decrease in obesity. Um, there should be you know in um, all the things that go with that. Uh, but then also there's also been a lot that have been with the cognitive and uh, social domains as well. So it's just important to note that students who are physically active have better overall academic scores and fewer behavioral incidents. Um, they also have greater social success and more positive relationships with their peers. As well as, um, it's been well shown that uh, if you have a student who has stereotypical behaviors, um, that a lot of times physical activity can decrease the amount of those. All right, so then here are just a few strategies that you might see uh, that are, you know, are frequently used in, in the world of APE. And so the first, and this is the picture right here, is of a cooperative game. Um, I kind of mentioned that earlier when talking about affective skills. But basically, and is this one right here is like I think they're, uh, you know, on skis. They all have to move together to get from one spot to another, and they have to communicate with one another, go through some problem-solving skills, and an APE teacher is there to. Uh, make sure that this is uh, occurring um, correctly, as well as that you know th that they're given the right tools and communication devices to interact with their peers as well. This has been an uh, incredibly, in my experience, a really really successful activity when working with students with emotional impairments. But it really is helpful for all students. I've seen every student uh, or every. Uh, 
type of disability um, engage in these and be successful in being a lab. Then there's uh, train peer models to demonstrate tasks and be a role model in physical education. This was from the high school I worked at, and they did a, a football day where uh, the football players came out and worked with our kids um, with disabilities. And so not only do train peer models often gain a really strong relationships with the students they work with, and, and that is with students with disabilities also gain a, a strong relationship with their peer models. Uh, students also, it's been shown to learn, they learn better when learning from a same age peer model uh, with these motor tasks and motor skills. And then lastly, and we'll talk, and this is what, you know, the focus of this presentation is going to be on, is uh, we modify and adapt rules and equipment to allow students to be challenged and be successful. That's a big part of what we do, uh, and, you know, that, that's, you know, a lot of the things that we do and don't even think about our low-end assistive technology things, but I'm going to go through that. And this picture right here is a commonly used technique where you might throw a hula hoop on a basketball net because a lot of students and a lot of students who are even uh, typically uh, developing, especially when they're in elementary, they can't reach a basketball net, so they're not going to be successful. So putting a hula hoop under it, and you can actually tie additional hula hoops under it, can be other ways that they can be successful with getting the hoop. Another note to make on that is if your student isn't uh, doesn't have the uh, strength yet to uh, get all the way up to that high net, um, a lot of times they will actually use incorrect form, and then that's something that you have to unteach in the future. So using these hula hoops to make it, you know, to challenge at their uh, their ability level. Um, it is a really good way to still teach form and for them to still be successful. All right, and then this is like the last thing I was going to show is just like what is adaptive physical education. So this is a, uh, an example of a cooperative game. Uh, it's a frequently used one called Crossing the River, where you have an assortment of different physical education equipment, poly spots, mats, scooters, and uh, you have, you know, instructions are get across no matter, you know, figure out how to get across. So they're open-ended, and um, you can use a lot of different devices, and the students can even be active in picking the devices that they want to use to get across. And then um, you, the important thing about a cooperative game is that at the end, you must do a debrief. So you want to relate all these strategies um, that they're using to their everyday life. Use how they've used all these different pieces of technology um, and different resources they've used to be successful with achieving their goal and getting somewhere. Another important concept within uh, cooperative games is that it's okay to not be six, uh, it's okay not to win or maybe to achieve your the goal that you wanted to. Um, sometimes that, that doesn't occur with these open-ended games. So it's a, a teaching moment to talk about, you know, why did this happen and is that okay? And um, learning how to win and lose. All right, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about the law. Um, special education includes physical education. Uh, it includes it within it, the definition of special education. So within the law, it states, and when I talk about the law, I'm talking about the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. Uh, physical education must be made available to all students and be specially designed if necessary. However, um, just like all spe special education services, there must be an eligibility process that goes through to determine that students with disabilities uh, need or would benefit from specially designed physical education. So a lot of students with disabilities might not need specially designed physical education and maybe just a few accommodations would make them successful um, and adapt uh, without needing the adaptive physical education services. So we're going to talk a little bit about IDEA, which uh, hopefully you're a little familiar with, and how it's important with uh, the field of physical education and APE. So it's important to know, and I find this to be the biggest thing when we're advocating for APE, is to say that physical education is the only curricular subject that is specifically defined within the definition of special education. And more specifically, um, this is the actual uh, terms, which I'm not going to read this, but here's the actual definition of physical education, uh, and I have another slide on it, and, and I'm showing you this because um, I believe this is going to be available online afterwards, 
And if this is something that you wanted to advocate for, here is the actual legislation in the federal law. There might be state mandates as well, but as you, um, this is a really big uh, advocacy piece is to say, look at this. Here's the definition of it. And right here, um, it needs to be specially designed if uh, needed. So, and I always also think it's very important to note that uh, lawmakers thought it was important enough to include in the law. Okay, a few other key points before we start talking about assistive technology. Uh, AP is considered a direct service rather than a related service. I won't get into that, but if you have questions at the end, I can talk about that. Uh, testing and services should be delivered with highly qualified individuals. Every state has different um, definitions of who is a highly qualified APE teacher, but hopefully you want teachers who have taught uh, students with disabilities in a physical education um, uh, realm. And then they should actively attend IEP meetings, although that often does not occur. Um, they are part of the IEP team if, if deemed necessary. And they should also have goals and objectives that they write and monitor uh, those goals. And then they should be consulting with the rest, rest of the team. They should be actively talking to parents, special educators, and that should be a two-way communication. All right, so now we're going to talk about uh, assistive technology and adapted physical education. So assistive technology and services, they are a process that ensures students with disabilities receive optimal access to learning across all education settings and subject areas. And of course, that means adapted physical education. We're going to talk about adapted physical education such as technology, and really they go together uh, quite well because what we do in adapted physical education, a lot of it is assistive technology and integrating it. So, um, and they can use it to uh, be physically active in, in class, in their community, as well as in extracurricular sport. Another thing I add to note is that APE teachers can also be a part of the transition team, as well as um, there was recently a Dear Colleague letter which said that uh, students with disabilities have the right to access um, uh, extracurricular activities. So in that idea, which I could talk more about if you have questions about, because that's a, a deep subject, but assistive technology could also be used to help students participate in or access uh, extracurricular activities. So then lastly, there's a range of different assistive technology that can be used for a variety of purposes and a variety of different types of disabilities. My background is I worked mostly with kids with visual impairments and emotional impairments and cognitive impairments. Um, and the way I've broken my presentation up is more just kind of looking at low tech, um, moderate technology and high tech and talking about that um, in the, that realm. But you could break this up a lot with different types of disabilities, especially when we start talking about physical disabilities. And there's a lot of things that are specifically made for kids that are visually impaired and so on and so forth. Okay, so some here are some examples of some different low-tech technologies that are available. We have bowling ramps, um, which you have probably seen these. A lot of uh, bowling alleys have these ready and they can be differently adjusted. Um, and actually this right here, what you see right here is another piece of assistive technology where somebody kind of like shuffleboard can kind of push a, uh, a, a bowling ball across as well. Hopefully you're familiar with simple switches as well. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a, in a few slides, but these can be used in a physical education class, um, not for communicating uh, what they want to do. I've seen it being used in cooperative games. I've seen it being used uh, to interact with different activities as well. And then Velcro gloves are a good way for kids that might struggle with grip to catch and throw balls. This is a guide rope here, which is usually going to be used for people with um, visual impairments. And the guide rope is something that a student can run back and forth with and hold on to, um, to kind of know uh, where they're at in location, know that they're safe. A lot of times kids with visual impairments, well, they're a little afraid to run into a wall. They're a little afraid to run in open space, which are big components of physical education. So using a guide rope or sometimes using a, a guiding rope uh, that you can have with a partner are huge things. And here's a quick video to, to go over that.
In this video, you will learn how to guide a blind or visually impaired runner. Guiding a blind or visually impaired runner isn't very difficult, provided that you know a few basic techniques. This will allow you to make running a real team sport. First, we will show you two guiding techniques, then some extra advice on communicating while running, and finally, some practical advice. Firstly, here are two guidance techniques. First, the tether. You can guide a blind or visually impaired runner with a cord or elastic 15 to 20 inches long or 40 to 50 centimeters. Both of you should tie one end of the cord around your wrist or slip the elastic around your middle finger in order to run. This method is ideal for easy paths that may be insufficient on less stable ground. If this is the case, favor the wrist holding guidance technique. You can guide a blind or visually impaired runner by holding their wrist or by asking them to hold yours. Direct contact makes for faster and more accurate guidance. We advise you to combine the two guidance methods and to switch from one to the other based on the width of the path, the surface on which you are running, and the presence of obstacles. All right, that's what I wanted to show you for, for that video. Okay, um, and then we use a lot of different types of uh, balls within uh, physical education, and this is something that is a, uh, they're very useful, uh, but there's many different types, so there's many more than what I'm showing you here, but I just thought I would kind of show you um, some of these different, uh, you know, balls that can be used. So obviously we have different colored uh, that can be really stimulating for kids with different types of sensory integration um, uh, disorders as well as then you can also have different texture balls. So a lot of times we use yarn balls which don't throw it, um, they don't go as far and you can have balls that you know that you can kind of play with and there's a million different types. Uh, here's a Sport Max ball and one of these right here actually uh, gives like, so for basketball, it actually tells you where to have your hand placement. So the ball itself teaches you how to properly perform different tasks. I believe they have it for uh, soccer and football as well. Um, and then this is a weighted ball. These are somewhat new um, and they call them, you know, weighted ball or slow motion ball. And what's in there is actually there's a piece of sand in it. And with that sand, you, you can kick it and such and um, it doesn't go as far because if you've ever taught soccer to students that are brand new to soccer what you'll notice it's a lot of chasing the soccer ball uh, but this is um, a really nice thing as well as it gives a lot of sensory integration um, within it too uh, one other one to mention is a really simple one is to get that nice sound with kicking it sometimes we want to add that effect that that big bang at the end of something to get kids to really do it is putting a plastic bag around a ball. Um, this is going to add a lot of sound to it and it's a really easy thing to do. All right, and then the next one I want to show you is um, bell balls. These, This is a trainer goal ball um, and it has, I think, three balls in it, which is part of it. They're used commonly um, for visually impaired athletes within the game of goal ball. Uh, which I'm going to show you a quick video of, but it can really be used for many things. And so what this for of goal ball is, is they're rolling a ball that has bells in it. They're blindfolded and they're trying to stop the ball uh, before it enters their net. So I'm going to show you a video on that. Skip a
All right. So I'm going to go back over here. Um, so as you can see, those are high-end athletes that were performing that game. Um, that ball has bells in it, like I said. And they're throwing it at really high uh, velocity, sometimes like 50 miles an hour. Um, but this is a commonly played game in most, uh, you know, self-contained classes with kids that are all visually impaired. However, I've used these balls with kids with um, severe and profound disabilities. And I've used it with kids that don't have visual impairments and I blindfold them and I have them perform this as well as, um, you know, they have bells in it. They make a lot of noise and they can be more interactive because of that. So these are actually some of my favorite tools to use. Okay, so mid-tech. So kind of going with that same idea right here is a uh, beeper balls. And these have a beeper like this one right here. They're in there and they beep the whole time. They kind of sound like a little like uh, far away fire alarm. And they let students who are visually impaired uh, know where something is. So they're beeping the whole time letting you know. Another thing I've done with kids with um, visual impairments is I put a metronome uh, behind a basketball uh, net um, or the backboard and it beeps the whole time continuously letting know kids where it's at. Um, so this can be used uh, with kids that have visual impairments. Another one is um, talking pedometers or watch or now we have these we have Apple watches sometimes we have Apple phones and all of these things if you go on it they each either you can get apps for it um, or they all take your your um, how much you're walking your steps. I'm sure some of you have Fitbits and such, and those, these are things that uh, we can make accessible to all students. Apple's been really good about having, uh, you know, the, the ability to voice those things out. And then here is uh, multi-step level switches, which are, you know, what I talked about before. This is a really cool video, and I'm going to talk over this one a little bit. So this is from a friend of mine, uh, Brad Wiener. And uh, Brad has used all these uh, different items. He's from uh, the school, uh, he's in Maryland schools. And this is a game of goalball. And I'm going to show you a few things that he's done with switches and such. But he allows kids to be successful. Um, a lot of times these kids have severe and profound disabilities. Uh, and he allows them to use these different pulley systems and such to be successful in their activities. So as you can see, this one is like a pulley system. They hit the ball down on the trampoline and then it goes into this, this created ski ball game, which kids with disabilities maybe they couldn't access before, but now we've given them the opportunity to do something that's fun and interactive and maybe something that can um, look similarly to something they're able to do in the, the community. And I'm gonna skip around a little bit with some of Brad's videos because he's actually, and he's got a uh, full website called myphysicaleducator.com and he has a lot of different videos. So this is one he created uh, where you're, the students are able to throw something and as you can see they pick something up and they throw it and it can go really far. And then this piece right here which he just showed is something else. So a lot of times we want to show this is a, uh, he told me this is a um, Oh, a snow blower, uh, something like that in here. And uh, it's a leaf blower. That's what it is, a leaf blower. And it blows out when uh, there's a switch in here that gets set off. So when the student gets into the target area, this goes off and it gives that big yay effect because we want students to be excited and want to know that they did something exciting and successful and do it again. And I, like I said, I'm going to jump around to a few more of these because he's got some really neat stuff in here. Let me go on. Let's get that. Show you croquet. And so these ones, all he does is he has these bowling ramps and he's put next to it. He's put on um, a piece of PVC. He puts in then and he's got it tied with some TheraBands. And he just backs up the, the crochet, uh, croquet instrument and then hits the ball. And obviously, you can do that towards different instruments. And Brad, like I said, he has a ton of different uh, things on this. 
and these help out with so many different things. We, we can work on extension and grasp and release and that whole idea of just cause and effect a lot of times that we're working with, especially when we're working with kids with low incident disabilities. And I really, even if you aren't working with kids with low incident disabilities, these things are awesome to see. This one's striking. Um, these are great to see because you get to see that all students with disabilities are able to engage in some form of physical education. Uh, we never need to say that some, this student can't do something. And all of these pieces of devices uh, really, really display that well. Um, all right. He's also got a video, and there he goes, showing you that you can do this with you know, a, a head push or something as well. So one other uh, video he has, too, is an outdooring one, if you ever want to check it out. And he actually shows how you can do this whole uh, scavenger hunt using uh, different uh, switches and such and uh, communicating with that. So those are great. All right, I'm going to start going a little faster because I'm seeing that my time is getting a little short. So right here we have a beat baseball kit. Uh, this is also for kids with visual impairments and this buzzes. It's all a part of this game called beat baseball. If you look into the YouTube, there's um, I have some different videos on your screen and this is one of them. Another one is extra gaming, so a lot of different games now, like Playstations and Wii's, um, I think it's Nintendo now, they have things where you can interact with uh, you know, the device. Then we have computers and apps, which I'll talk about in a moment, and then sports-specific wheelchairs. We have very, very uh, nice and refined specific wheelchairs that are developed for uh, different types of sports now. And they can be pricey, but there are some different organizations that can help you out with the price. Sometimes there's state organizations as well. Um, but there's you know different types of chairs now that are developed for kids with um, that are that are have physical impairments that are uh, trying to participate in different sport, as well as a school um, should provide you access if it's warranted. Okay, so here are some examples of some apps that promote physical activity. Um, this first one I'm going to talk about a little bit more in depth. It's called Exercise Buddy. It's probably the most well-known one that I'm aware of, and it has this whole video modeling application that's specifically designed to help individuals with autism uh, exercise, and this one is $30, but I really think it's well worth it. Here are two other ones, a Lazy Monster. So this is um, using your own body weight exercises, so it's no equipment. And it, it provides you in different incentives. And then this one is a uh, one that I used a few years ago, and it's called The Adventures of Super Stretch. And what it does is it has all these different like yoga poses, and it models it after animals. It's fun and easy to do. I used to do it with my uh, pre-K class. Okay, so a little bit more about Exercise Bo uh, Buddy. Exercise Buddy, I think, is pretty unique because what it's doing is it, it really integrates all of these best practices that we know with autism. It also allows us to um, create individualized content and collect data. Um, so you can make something for every student you have, as well as you can um, have their goals and objectives in there and go through it and just say, okay, they did so many push-ups today, boom, 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 and then it's in there and you can show that to parents and such. Um, and then the video modeling is all conducted by children and adolescents with autism, which is really neat. Uh, they also have social stories, task analysis, and visuals within there. And they also are now offering this Autism Exercise Specialist Certificate, which teaches one to work with people with this uh, autism in a fitness center. And that, this is through the ACSM. Um, so if you go to ACSM or their uh, website, you'll see this. I'm going to go to their website real quick. Okay. And so this is really neat. They even show you how they're using these different, um, they have the different social narratives in here, not social stories, I always forget that that's copywritten. Um, so they have all, you know, this different things, they have it with all these different physical activity things that we're doing. They have visual support, so they show you a video or some um, pictures to show you what it looks like to do these different exercises. Um, and they have video modeling of a lot, and I know that David uh, Gelslick, the guy who's created this, He's always making more and more of these videos, and he actually, I believe, pays the uh, kids with autism as well to participate. 
So then we also will say for the teacher side of it and the special education side of it, this gives us some really nice data to work from and some really easy to use things. I know there's two different um, ones and some of them allow you to do one full class. I think one or two students and one allows you to do as many as you like. All right. And then there's also like a whole uh, first then system as well. So it's like first do this and then you can do this and you can program it however you like. So you can use that as well. Oh, and then I want to go to their home. All right, and then I'm going to show you this video. And then after that, I'm going to take some questions. The students conduct themselves. It brings out a different side. They're more engaged, they are more enthusiastic, and they receive the gratification that they really strive for. The exercise buddy helps because it shows them how to like do the exercise. It's like a routine to them because like, every time we come to the room, they know that we have to exercise. Just the ability to walk in calmly, go to their number, look at the exercise buddy, and understand how to do the warm-up how to identify the body parts. Exercise Buddy does a good job of highlighting it and making that body part very specific. Because on the iPad, I can show them the people in the body who are just like them and they are listening. Exercise Buddy has really affected my first graders the most. Coordination in general was something that all my first graders have dramatically improved following, understanding left, right, understanding uh, how to move in a structured pace rather than just running from point A to point B. Exercise Buddy created a wonderful structure and way of modeling it so that they model that exactly. I've seen it with the students, first of all, excited to use Exercise Buddy, but they don't get silly with it. In just a short period of time, the students have bought into the system very well. Exercise Buddy helps me because sometimes maybe I want to know how to do it and I need to show, I need to be able to know how to show them how to do it. The Exercise Buddy app is a phenomenal way of using a start-finish model. It's easy to navigate. You can set up the routines very easy without the video support that Exercise Buddy provides and without the consistent visuals. I would not have been successful in the program. They almost allow the teacher to take a step back and really watch the natural process. All right. So I, I won't uh, condone his last statement that it takes the teacher out of the process, but it is a nice tool to uh, help us. Um, and it, I think one of the peer mentors in that video makes a really good point of just saying that you know, we're not, in being a physical educator, you're not going to know every single sports skill. Uh, and this is a nice reminder sometimes, especially if you're using peer mentors, to say, okay, how do you do this correctly? Okay. All right, so just to review, we went over the different specific benefits of, children, um, of APE uh, for students with disabilities. And remember, it is often overlooked, so we a lot of times need to advocate for it to be on IEPs. We need to advocate for APE teachers to be a part of the conversation. Um, we need to advocate for goals and objectives. And then the federal law, we discuss IDEA, it's specifically identified in there. This is a great tool, a great piece of information to use when advocating for adaptive physical education. And then we went over the different levels of assistive technology and understand how they can be utilized in an adaptive physical education setting. All right, so the last thing is here are some different resources. I think this is going to be on afterwards, but um, you know, this is there are a lot of resources out there. I have a podcast and a blog. I have about 35 episodes now, and it's being used in about a dozen college courses throughout the nation. So please give it a listen. I think it's Got some good quality, although I'm trying to fix the audio a little bit uh, currently. But um, then uh, there's also webinars for Shape America, which is our national PE organization. Um, this is one, a really nice document that outlines like, you know, frequently asked questions about APE. 
And then my physical educator, which was Brad's uh, website that I showed you earlier, which he has a bunch of lesson plans and a bunch of videos, and his, uh, his blog is wonderful. So uh, please give it a listen. Okay. So now I believe I'm supposed to uh, field some questions. So I'm trying to see if I can get to your questions. Let's see here. Okay, so what was the name of the monster app? It's called Lazy Monster. Go through this to the I'm going to look through and see if there's any questions I missed as well. Okay, so I'm going to answer, or I'm going to talk about, um, I'm going to put up this slide with the benefits real quick and for Joe, and then I'm going to discuss the issue that Kelly's having because that's an interesting um, and I'm gonna have this one up for you, okay, Joe? Okay, <clears throat> so Kelly, you have the, the issue of you don't have credentialed APE teachers in your district. Um, would you let me know what state you're into at some point? But okay, and short of having specially designed activities with regular PE teachers. Okay, so what you should do, this is a common issue. Okay, so California, it actually, you have pretty strong guidelines on what adaptive physical education is in California, but we do have a, uh, we have a very legitimate lack of um, quality adaptive physical education teachers within the, our entire field. Obviously, if you go to Los Angeles or I was just in Dallas, we have a lot of them, but in rural areas, that is a common, common issue. So that is... Um, your, what you need to do, or what I would suggest you do, is you're most likely going to, since you're trying to actively find, you know, these qualified teachers, you're not in any type of in compliance issue. However, uh, what you need to do is you need to probably help train your physical educators. Um, and, you know, there's a ton of different ways, but, but, but in reality, really, we have a lack of adapted physical education, professional development, uh, let alone just going to, um, just going to like, you know, conferences and such. Uh, but you might even consider sending them to, you know, in California, you have the National APE Conference, uh, which is going to be in San Diego this year. I'm actually going to be the keynote speaker uh, this year. So please send them there and hopefully they can get a little bit more information um, but you kind of need to cultivate, especially in a rural area, you need to cultivate this APE knowledge, and it's a really difficult thing. Um, and that's something that may, I could maybe talk to you more about. I could share my email with you because this is like, man, it can be, uh, that, that is a daunting thing when you don't have the, the experience um, teachers that you want in your class because it, and it, one thing that you really want to avoid is that if you do have kids that have severe health issues with it too, make sure that your physical educators are understand it. Maybe they're working with a nurse or something like that. However, we don't want our students with disabilities not to be engaged with physical activity. So we need to get that done somehow. Um, so Kelly, hopefully I'm answering some of these. Uh, some of these, uh, I'm answering some of your things about not having APE teachers in your district, but, and maybe I can share my information with you later because there is a, that is a, that's a tough question. Um, but I always, in my podcast and everything, I always try to answer those tough questions because I always feel like everyone tries to avoid them. <laughs> so um, maybe we could talk even more about it. So, all right, so let me see. I'm going to go back up a little bit. All right, so I have, 
Okay, so Deanne has, let's see, what do, okay. Okay, what do specific activities, what are some specific activities using guiding ropes? Um, I really have only seen it used and used it myself um, in actual like track kind of games or like where running's happening. However, I think you could really easily integrate it into some type of obstacle course. You could even have sighted peers uh, using it as well. I, I do a lot of different activities. I did it when I was a PE teacher and I do it as a college educator where I put a lot of students in with um, like I put blindfolds on them and then they run the course too. So maybe at some point they have to run as fast as they can. They have to put a blindfold on and they have to run as fast as they can with a guide rope. Um, also, it's a nice thing. Uh, a big I do actually a cooperative game. I shouldn't say I don't have anything because I do. I do a cooperative game with sighted um, students usually, and they have to go around my school um, where they do sighted guide, which was the second thing in the video they showed you of just kind of grabbing someone's arm. And um, I have them do kind of go around the school and then they have to switch who's the sighted guide. And then I usually have them go to a track in the, my school has a track. They go to the area with the track and then they have to do one thing where they have to run and they have to use a more like a tether rope with it. All right. Okay, is there a website to communicate with APE teachers? Cindy asked that one. Um, that's not, we don't have a great website for that. Uh, we have a national, we call it NICPED, it's N-C-P-E-I-D, and that's our national uh, consortium for physical education, which I was a board member of until just recently. I just stepped uh, down from it or my, my period uh, ran off, but that's one website you can look at, but we don't really have a forum for that. The only other one we have is called Shape Exchange. Uh, and that's that website I showed you at the very end called Shape America. But Shape Exchange, though, is like, I think it's only for Shape members, which is somewhat costly. And that's the only one that I am aware of, actually. Um, but that's probably something that we really, 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 really need. Okay, the yoga is, let me make sure that I have that right. The yoga app is called, sorry for anybody, Adventures of Super Stretch. For uh, Catherine. Um, okay, there is another, Jolanda, uh, there is another website called uh, nc-ape.com. I've heard of this actually. I'm going to go to it real quick. Very cool. Uh, Laura Brickhouse uh, is a, there, I think, 2016 APE Teacher of the Year, and she's on this board, I believe. Uh, she was on my podcast as well. Okay, just getting to this. Okay, so let's answer one of these other really hard ones. So um, it says, okay, you want the slide. Let me go to Joe Ellen's real quick. She has slide, uh, what is APE? I'll go back to that one for you. Okay, so Melanda, though, and uh, is asking, okay, how can I use these regulations to get services in the IEP? Her students, how can I get around districts, especially rural, from preventing the PE teacher to attend? As they say, the OT will provide the services. Well, um, Melinda, and maybe you can answer this, what state you're in, so I can get a little bit better feel. Um, but there are, okay, there's, that's a complicated question because there are certain states that have defined APE teachers as someone who's knowledgeable about APE content, and that can include OTs. Um, but what I would suggest is that you strongly say that you like the reasoning of why you want a PE teacher. Um, you state the laws in there, um, and then you kind of you may, you ask kind of is an OT. For, there's a few different ways you can go with. So is an OT um, are they knowledgeable about the physical education curriculum? Most likely they are not, because you want them to directly teach a curriculum. Another thing that you can kind of bring up is that PE teachers are direct service providers where OTs are related service providers. So if, especially if they're actually providing the whole thing and not just doing consultative, uh, if they don't have a teaching license, that's problematic as they're teaching a direct service. So that's probably a big one you could kind of get on there. Let's see if she posted, okay, you're in uh, Pennsylvania. I'm not sure about, I don't think Pennsylvania has 
requires the APE endorsement, but some do. Okay, let's see here. Okay, I see. Uh, all right, sorry, I'm just kind of going through these. Okay, great. Uh, I like Tara. Tara's got, um, she has an Illinois, and I'm in Iowa, so please contact me because that's not too far away from where I'm at. You have a social media site called Sites Google View ICAP. That's awesome. Um, I know that California also has the SoCal APE page. It sounds specific, but it's really, they got, it's probably the, one of the, be the best social media ones I've seen. Um, I love, I'm going to check out your Twitter pages as well. Um, that's great. We need more, uh, more of those things. We have some Facebook and uh, Twitter pages right now. I think our big one is Adapted Physical Education Specialist or Adapted PE Specialist. Todd's posting some of these other ones. Um, the Adapted Physical Education channel, they, I'll look into that for you, Todd, because actually I think they have another channel or something now. I follow them. Nice comment, uh, Cindy Daniels. Okay, great. Sounds like I'm, yes, I'm getting to some of these a little later, so I apologize. Yes, Joellen, Paralympics has instructional videos on how to play these different sports. Um, they have a ton, as well as uh, Lakeshore Foundation, which is based out of the University of uh, Alabama, has some really great stuff. Um, the tech, if, you're, if you are working with kids that are blind, the Texas School for the Blinds um, YouTube page is just, like, phenomenal. Uh, and no, oh, let me go back to the Twitter conference. So where can I communicate with APE teachers? I saw the hashtags. We use a hashtag called APE Chatter. I'll put that in there. We use that, and that is what I use to talk about APE Chatter. Use that one. That is my favorite one. Um, ooh. Uh, okay, I'm like all over. I'm trying to, to do this. So as an OT, it concerns me that OT will take play care of adaptive physical education. Yeah, no, you, that's what you should be doing. You should be consulting. I do also, I'm going to make a quick statement. Um, the term is adapted physical education rather than adaptive physical education. Um, I'm not going to go into the whole why, but we just want to consistently use the term adapted versus adaptive. Um, just, just so that's a big thing in our field the last five, ten years that we really want to be consistent with using that term adapted. Very good, Tara. Yes. OT and PTs are services related to education. Good, 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 good. So I'm looking at Tara's and yeah, so the thing with, so what I'll say is that about going back to that whole uh, APE teachers teaching APE or PE teachers, that's who should be versus OTs and PTs. Um, you want APE teachers and PE teachers teaching it. There are a few states uh, that have some uh, things so you're not in violation of state law. But um, hopefully we're trying to achieve more than just not being in violation of state law. So for best practices, you always want a physical educator who's trained in APE or an APE teacher teaching it. I believe this webinar will be archived. Is there any other questions I can field for you? Is there any other um, uh Slide you'd like to see? Yeah, so an so the OTPT thing, that is a, uh, a bit of a, I think in our world is a, a lot of times people don't know the difference. Um, a lot of times people don't think that there is a difference. A lot of people think that APE is a related service. Uh, it is not. Um, but like I said, there are specific states that do have guidelines that say physical educators are the ones um, that are supposed to, to provide it. There's other states that specifically state that physical that there are physical therapists and occupational therapists that are allowed to teach it, which does not seem right. 
Um, but I think you're right, though. We want to use that that term of direct service. We are a direct service. We have a curriculum that we teach versus we like we help related services are helping attain a curriculum. Yes, absolutely, Tara. Absolutely. Very cool. And Tara, if you might, can I ask you kind of like generically where you're at? Because I'm just, I'm in Cedar Falls, which I know is like less than an hour from the Illinois border, but I'm, I just got here yesterday. But if you're in the area, I, I'm looking for APE teachers to connect with and um, you know help with the advocacy in the state of Iowa and such. I'm going to go to that site real quick too. Oh, cool. Good stuff. Um, I don't know for the survey if that's mine. OK, I'm going to look that city up a little later because I don't know where that's at because I'm brand new here, but I really want to. Um, this site is um, the one Tara provided, which is her like APE uh, site, and I think it's their uh, state. And a lot. So another thing to also mention is not all states have it, but a lot of states, all states have like a CEC, a special education um, conference. Sometimes APE will be a presentation or two in there. And then all states also should have a SHAPE conference or like an, a PE conference. And a lot of times APE is going to be embedded within that. So we'll have a few presentations. Then there's a few states um, that have APE specific uh, conferences like California, Minnesota, Texas, Maryland. Those are ones I'm aware of. So those are, you know, not every state has that though. Um, and what one thing I would really like to know, uh, to to at some point get is like all the states that have an APE specific conference because it's not well known. I think North Carolina is developing one right now too. So you have a full day of adapted sessions in Illinois. That's great. I love it. Thank you so much, uh, Jolanda. I really appreciate that. And can I just say that this has actually been a really awesome experience. I was a little nervous about doing a, a webinar like this, but it's been really fun. I, and I love how many people are connecting. All PE sessions should automatically include differentiated teaching within, which is adaptive physical education. Yes, um, that is true. Uh, I think when we start adding in like the different modifications and such, then it becomes even more. And we, but you know, I that statement I think about all, you know, that differentiated instruction should be everywhere. I think is true, but I think it's also true that we need to definitely train people in how to work with kids with disabilities within the uh, physical education realm. Okay. Okay, cool. So Virginia's got one too. Yeah, Virginia's got some great APE professors up there with uh, uh, Justin Hagel and um, and uh, Catherine, and there's some really great people up in Virginia now. I didn't know that they had a whole session though. I'm gonna pull that one up real quick. And Tara said there's another one that the Illinois one is in um, mid um, mid November. Iowa's is actually in June, which is very unique. Oh, I think there's Sheila. <laughs> oh, very cool. Oh, cool. So James Madison uh, has a week-long 1-3 graduate. Credit. So if you want to go down to that one, that is excellent. 
Um, and uh, Tom Moran is is uh, that, and Kathy McKay, I think. Correct, Sheila? Anyway, we've got a small small world in AP. <laughs> Thank you very much. The Illinois Coalition for Adaptive Physical Education is ready to help. Awesome, Tara. I love seeing that. So you got an IK cape. So, and then another thing I didn't mention too uh, is that we do have a national certification, which is called a CAPE normally, uh, for APE teachers. Wonderful. And yes, Cindy, Louisiana has a certification for APE. Uh, there's about 13 states that have certifications, so they basically require that you get an endorsement in APE to teach APE. Uh, Louisiana's one, um, Minnesota's one, uh, California's one, Michigan's one, I believe Indiana and Wisconsin are one. Man, this is a great audience. All right, is there any other questions or any other things I can do for you? Um, you know, I'm going to just share my personal email on here, if that's okay. You can give, I'll give you my, my professional one, actually, because I'm professional now. So please email me anytime you have questions. I have no problem answering that. And also give the, my podcast a listen. Um, a lot of people seem to really connect to it, and that's been nice. I think... Um, Something really nice about the podcast is it allows people um, in rural areas and everywhere to kind of hear people that are maybe in similar situations. And as you all know, being AP, if you're in the field of AP, we're a small field, so sometimes it's hard to collaborate with people on a regular basis. Thank you, Anna. How will you organize this to begin with? Um, they actually, uh, I got to say the way I organize it is I believe... I think she left, but one of the they they contacted me, um, so they wanted this on there, and they contacted me, um, and I was like, of course. And we talked a little bit about um, doing another set of these. So, and actually, I gotta say, Todd and, and Anna, who's there, if you wanted, to, uh, Anna and Todd on here, they're the ones that kind of run this, and they're called the um, oh man, I'm gonna say it wrong, the CD. CTD and let me I'll go to their website real quick. Oh no, I'm not that's not it. I'll show you real quick. Yeah, Center on Technology and Disability. So this is the organization that uh, did this webinar and everything is on there. Yep, there you go. And uh, they got a whole bunch of different uh, things. They have uh, you know a bunch of things. This is the first one I believe on APE. And this has gone really well, so I don't know if Todd and Anna want to do another one, um, either with me or with somebody else. And I think it's been great. Yes, they do. They they have some really good webinars on there. I've I've checked out a few of them. There's some really great stuff out there. And this is going to be archived because of that, so you can continue sharing it. And it's free. Yes, it is. All right, well, thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, I thought this was a really good webinar. We hope that you enjoyed it just as much as we did. Um, we're going to be sending out an email with the recording and any um, other materials. And uh, please, feel, uh, please join us again for another CTD webinar. Here's some of the different ones that have just occurred. Mm. Thank you. This has been awesome.